morning. Welcome to day three of the Office of Family Assistance Regions, one through four TANF directors meeting. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. We've provided a lot of information over the past two days. I hope you found it helpful in some way. First session yesterday was on addressing homelessness. Lauren Dutton gave an overview of OPRE's homelessness study. I really appreciated having DC and Mercer County, New Jersey share all of their efforts around providing families shelter and homeless services. And then how about that session on internal controls and monitoring? Our colleagues from the ACF Office of Administration gave us some very valuable information on subrecipient monitoring, grant fraud, audit findings, and more. Then New York City brought it home with an overview of their advanced internal control structure. A takeaway from these sessions um, in my mind could be that strengthening processes to meet a specific goal can also have a positive residual impact on your program. In the homelessness session, for example, both DC and Mercer County showed us how grading funding and integrating services help meet their goals to solve immediate problems like evictions and preventing homelessness homelessness more efficiently and expeditiously. But in the long term, this work led to significant decreases in home chronic homelessness among families. Uh, I think that's a pretty big deal. Um, and during the session on internal controls and monitoring, New York City showed us how their work to strengthen their internal controls has led to more efficient processing and reduced occurrences of fraud and misuse. I'd like to share what I think is a residual impact of this work. Um, but first, just to put it into perspective, New York is a county administered state with 58 counties. New York City is comprised of just five of those counties, but has the highest concentration of TANF recipients. Uh, when I last looked, it was around 64%, uh, while the remaining cases are spread among the other 53 counties. So I believe a residual impact of this work is that New York has actually achieved zero, zero errors in their TANF and SSP MOE work participation data that's submitted to us. Um, since I'm all about the data, this is a, a pretty big deal to me. And if any of you have um, happened to have gotten caught up in any of the data issues in your state, um, you know what I'm talking about. So um, great takeaways there um, for me. And another issue that stood out to me was the review of transferring TANF funds to CCDF and SSDG. This topic may seem obscure, but it's actually very important to track these funds to ensure that CCDF or SSDG establish adequate eligibility criteria. Uh, and another importance of tracking these funds is to note that when TANF funds are transferred to CCDF or SSDG, they fall under the rules of those programs. TANF funds are available until expended, but CCDF and SSDG funds expire after a period of time. I think it's uh, two years. So another benefit to monitoring the transfer is that monitoring will give you an opportunity to return any unspent TANF funds to the TANF account before they expire. So um, that's just my two cents. And uh, moving along the agenda, uh, you may remember day one, our new director got pulled away to tend to an urgent matter and wasn't able to join us. But she wanted to be sure to find a way to address you. So she's graciously provided a pre-recorded message. So now we'll hear from our new OFA director and flag. Mike. Hello, my name is Ann Flagg and I am the new director for the Office of Family Assistance and the Administration for Children and Families. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this regional meeting. I'm so grateful to each of you for taking the time to engage with your peers and colleagues, the OFA team and partners to learn from one another, share strategies that work across your teams, and most importantly, build our collective vision for family economic well-being in your communities. 
In this meeting, we will bring together TANF leaders to discuss a variety of issues facing the families we serve every day. Looking at the agenda for this week, I'm pleased to know that we are touching on critical and pressing topics that impact our programs, while also exploring many of the strategic goals we aim to address at ECF and OFA. Our priorities at OFA are driven by a commitment to advance equity and reduce structural barriers that prevent social and economic well-being for all. The pandemic and subsequent economic recession have highlighted the fact that our programs have not always served families of color and under other underserved groups well. OFA is taking several steps, beginning internally, to improve equity by assessing our communications, promotional and website materials with an equity lens. We will look at, for example, how we would describe the TANF program and TANF participants. From there, we will determine what refinements are needed for messaging on all of our platforms. Additionally, OFA will develop TA strategies to work side by side with grantees to assess your needs and to assist you in developing or refining strategies related to race equity. We want to use this time to share strategies that work in advancing families' economic well-being through basic assistance, job preparation, and family strengthening programs. We want to learn how each of you brings your innovative program solutions and leverage your community partnerships to build pathways to economic mobility over generations. We want to hear your ideas for whole family and community-led strategies to help increase economic mobility. We want to hear how we as federal partners can support this work. Please share your successes and your challenges, your inspired ideas and your innovations. Over the next several days, OFA regional staff have planned multiple sessions that aim to provide you with helpful and concrete information and tools to enhance your programs and support to children and families. In this time together, we also hope you have the chance to uh, meaningfully engage and connect with one another to discuss and share your promising efforts. So many facets of our lives have been disrupted over these last two years, our schools, workplaces, and even access to the most basic of necessities. Stress stressors placed on families and particularly low income families have been significant and overwhelming. I hope this week helps each of your programs in moving forward with innovative and customer centered approaches to supporting families and achieving financial stability. I'd like to thank each of you for being here today, for your dedication, your hard work, supporting families. We value the work you do each and every day. I'd also like to thank the regional staff who worked so hard to make this important meeting happen. It is an honor to be here with you today and I look forward to our work together. Hi, folks. Um, just some quick logistics information. I know that you're probably tired of this slide, but in just in case there are some new faces, we just want to make sure that everybody has the same information. So there have been a number of PowerPoints and associated materials um, throughout the meeting. Those will all be available on the Bizabo website, um, which the link is provided to you in daily reminders. We'll be following up with a an email after the meeting linking to some of these resources as well. Uh, we ask that you remain on mute until requested for Q&A. If necessary, please rename yourself for discussion purposes. Uh, you can do that by hovering over your name and clicking on the three dots that appear. There are live captions available. If you click on more at the bottom of your screen and then show subtitle. Uh, we want this to be an interactive session throughout and you all have done a, a great job of, of weighing in and, and submitting questions throughout presentations. So we wanna keep that going. Just use the chat box whenever the uh, inspiration hits you. There will be an evaluation survey provided at the end of this meeting. We really wanna hear from you about the meeting to, to learn what we can uh, utilize and improve on for future TA meetings, whether virtually or in person, hopefully soon. Uh, and of course, if you need assistance at any point, just send us a message in the chat box 
and tech support will assist. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Chantel, thanks. It looks like we may have uh, lost Chantel. I'm not sure if she disconnected. Yeah, okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I think Zoom went out for, for a few of us. I was able to get back in. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that uh, on the federal side, we're having some VPN issues. So I don't know if- um, I heard about the, I heard that- People are starting I'm, on my, I'm on my home computer <laughs> because I couldn't get on my TSP. I'm in the- um, Right, the uh, bin member is not working, the bin card. Unfortunately, the technical assistance we offer does not <laughs> to be. Well, the help desk said to just reboot your computer. I've tried that four times. It's not working. So. All right. I'm back. Uh, Kicked off. There she is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Um, so where are you? Um, Topic session four, yes. This session is all about encouraging the use of data to advance race equity in TANF programs. During day one, we had an opportunity to hear from Dr. Nicole Brassard. She's been working feverishly with OFA to help guide our work around racial equity and inclusion. And I must be, say it's been quite an experience and I'm honored to be doing this work. During this session, we have a brief presentation where she is accompanied by uh, Dr. Carla McCullough and Dr. Rodney Washington, who are both also rock stars in the area of advancing race equity. So without further ado, uh, let's hear from uh, Nicole Broussard, Carla McCullough, and Rodney Washington. Good afternoon, good morning. We are thrilled to be here. And we have been invited by the Office of Family Assistance to share a little bit about racial equity and data. And rather than just talking to you about that topic kind of as a concept, we wanted to be able to share a little bit about what the Office of Family Assistance is doing around this issue. But also to do that, first I wanna introduce you to who is here with me? This is the facilitation team that is supporting the work that is going on at the Office of Family Assistance to really bring racial equity to the center of everything that is going on there. Here. So I wanna have Dr. Carla go ahead and lay a foundation here just of some basic concepts and terms related to racial right equity. Now, this Perfect, thank you, Dr. Nicole. So I really want to start out talking about the difference between equality and equity, because equity you'll hear a lot throughout this conversation. Um, and sometimes it's used interchangeably, um, but we want you to know the difference. Equality really means ensuring that everyone has and receives the same resources. It's uniformity. While equity means ensuring that everyone has what they need, it's fair distribution. So as we talk about racial equity, we want to ensure that every person has what they need. Racial equity ultimately is just the fair treatment of all people resulting in fair opportunities and access for everyone to thrive. Therefore, racial inequity it's when two or more racial groups are not standing on the same ground. So if you, as we talk about operationalizing racial equity, it just means examining the policies, practices, procedures, and decisions to obtain insight into the experiences of racial ethnic groups that are engaged within your system, and then taking action to improve it. And finally, we want to talk about applying a racial equity lens. You utilize the information that you currently have. 
ask the right questions, examine those policies, practices, procedures, and decisions, and then you make those appropriate adjustments. This is where we talk about utilizing data. Well, I just want to say to make transformative change when it comes to racial equity, you have to start with asking the right questions. Are the decision makers reflective of the racial ethnic groups that are going to be engaged or supported by the policy practices, procedures, or decisions? Is anyone left out? Can we actually make this change? Those are three major questions that we need to ask in order to apply a racial equity lens because you have the power and the privilege to make those changes within OFA. And I just want to end by saying there's a, a saying by Ijoma Alua that says, when we identify where our privilege intersects with somebody's oppression, that's where we can make change. So hopefully you can do that. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. K. So, and let Dr. Rodney then really start to break down how do you put all of these things together in a way that allows a human services system like TANF to be more equitable and to bring racial equity into the center? How do we make data a meaningful part of this work? Dr. Rodney. Thank you, Dr. Nicole. So I think the meaningful part is, is the important piece of that. So oftentimes, you know, we think about data, that's sort of a scary animal for, for folk to start to wrestle with. And it shouldn't be. Data should be a, a regular part of any system to evaluate and assess and to bring about change, right? But oftentimes data is often reviewed or uh, looked upon as a mechanism to report out or to maintain your funding, right? And it's not exactly set up to really get the inner workings and sort of the nuance around how the organization feels, the culture, the climate, the norms. And that's a heavy piece. When we're thinking about the racial equity and, and we're thinking about social justice and how people feel about equity versus equality, as Dr. McCullough just stated, we have to get an understanding of where people land on that. And in order to do that, that has to be a data collection process. And it doesn't have to be a big data set. You know, sometimes people think it's the quantitative part of the work. It's not exactly that. It could be qualitative sort of conversations that begin to lend themselves from a a listening session to a focus group that you get those themes and then you can drill down a bit deeper on those themes to get an understanding of the direction that you're moving in. The important piece about data that we need to understand is that data depersonalizes information. It's no longer Rodney saying that this is how uh, the organization moves or functions. It's the data shows that this is an area that we should put more emphasis on. The data is saying that this is an area that needs more attention. So it gets the onus off of a person or an administrator to enforce a, a particular policy, but it creates a landscape that is, it, that is inclusive. And also if we're talking about it equitable, that everybody has a shared part in how policy moves and where that understanding comes from. And so you can start, it doesn't have to be something really vast. It can start with the data that you have access to. So the first thing is to define your priorities. What are your priority areas within the organization that you would like to examine? And then from those priority areas, where are the data points to really look at this? What I like about the work that's been happening uh, on this project is that there was a great deal of, of scaling out that uh, this work didn't start with just collecting data. There was first uh, Dr. McCullough and, and Dr. Cole just coming in in providing awareness and education to make sure that if terms and everything were used, that everybody started on the same footing in understanding that piece. And then bringing it to now where are the priority areas and then where are the data points for us to begin to collect and assess this information and how do we go about defining those data points that are linked to uh, those priority areas. And that piece is called the alignment piece. The alignment piece is important because everything that you collect should be connected to a particular priority area. For example, HHR look, began to look at uh, the hiring practices, uh, how language is used in job announcements. But that came about through understanding 
and looking at the job announcements that have already been landed, who was applying for those positions, and how do they market those positions out? All right. And so that wasn't just about a person looking and saying, we need to do a little bit better with how our hiring practices look. It is more, it was more gauged toward how do we begin to get the common language that we learned that uh, from the vocabulary and the education that we had through the previous sessions, how do we begin to have common language that we now embed into our practices for hiring? And that is just one example. And so the gist of it is data gets to tell us how do we know what we know? How exactly do we know what we know? And so in defining where those data points are coming from, it doesn't, again, it starts with a small step toward creating a system because we don't want it to be a place where policies and decisions are made exactly individually, but it should be inclusive of a shared governance and a process that is allowing folks to participate in that policy change. And it is driven by that data. So I think that the larger part of the organization is understanding that how all this works. And then once we set this system up, how then do we evaluate it? How do we know it's working? So it's not a one and done. It continues to move and flow through a process that everybody can participate in and it will move as the organization shifts and as you learn more. Yeah, I, I think that to uh, Dr. Collis' point, you know, and asking the right questions, start your process, create spaces to start to ask the right questions so that you can establish your baseline. It is important to know if your organization is going to move years from now, you can look back on that and reflect and say how we move. And we know how we move because we established the baseline to understand the areas that we want to work in. And so again, practical, practical, practical. It doesn't have to be comprehensive. It can just uh, keep it simple. Ordinary conversations can land into spaces that can really land uh, to make people feel inclusive and build a buy-in. We wanna build a buy-in so everybody participates in this process. I'm sure there have been other efforts to collect data and make change. This has to look entirely different and it has to be inclusive and data is a part of that process. Love it. Thank you, Dr. Rodney. I love it. Uh, these are big topics. The, these can be difficult conversations. Hopefully what we've given you will give you some additional fodder and we'll give you some additional tool set, mindset, and skill set that will help you take what you hear and actually put it to work for you back in your program. With that, I will say thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rodney. Thank you so much, Dr. Carla. And we look forward to hearing the good news that you create in your systems. Be well. Wow, that was great. Um, our time is limited, so we haven't gotten, uh, we didn't get a chance to read bios. Um, the panelists we just saw are very accomplished in individuals, and like I said, rock stars in their field, and their bios are available in the um, handouts. I think we're going to attempt to pivot until we can get Chantel back on. Um, is Tiki available? I am. Hi, Tiki. Would you like to introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll get started? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Tiki Brown. I'm an assistant commissioner of Children and Family Services at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Um, I oversee uh, an array of programs, including uh, Minnesota Family Investment Program, which is our TANF program, um, economic assistance programs, including SNAP um, uh, and other cash programs, child care, child support. Um, I'm not used to listing off this whole list. Let me think, child care, child support, um, child safety and permanency programs. Um, Anyway, a wide array of children and family programs um, at the Department of Human Services. So um, I will just share a little bit more about myself. Um, when I first joined state government, I joined with the goal of improving access, making the process for applying and receiving public benefits and support less stigmatized. And 20 years later, I've been uh, working towards that goal, um, but I've added a few you know, nuances. So adding in diversity as a core value and a commitment to addressing equity, 
um, just embedding uh, that in my approach to my work, no matter what my role um, is within, within state government or outside of state government. So during my time with you today, I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, how uh, sharing a little bit about how we have set up our staff and our agency um, from within with a diversity, equity, and inclusion framework, how this has led to better engagement strategies and outcomes with our partners and community and participants. And then I'll just um, um, pepper in a few examples of some of the efforts that we are doing in Minnesota. So um, I am in a state uh, that has what is known as the Minnesota paradox. Um, it is a great place to live. Um, if you are looking to, um, you know, achieve your goals, uh, have a, you know, a home, really, um, so, you know, just have, you know, great community schools, etc. But all of that exists if you are white. In Minnesota, on almost every level, uh, if you are African American or um, American Indian, there is equity in home ownership in wage and salary earnings, in school suspension rates, and child maltreatment rates. So we're at the very bottom or near the bottom in almost every measure with regard to disparities that are impacting African-Americans and American Indians. So therefore, that is the Minnesota paradox. Um, so as a result of that, you know, we've known this for a long time, especially people of color in Minnesota, and it's taken a long time for people to move from admiring the problem to actually acknowledging the issues that help reinforce this and, and really move towards action. And so at the department, we have had um, a number of tools at our disposal that we have embedded to ensure that staff, that policymakers, that contract managers, that our evaluation and data folks um, all have a identified role that can help break the embedded bias, the structural racism, that everybody's learning and understanding their role, and that we are creating an environment in which it's difficult to continue doing the same thing over and over again, whether it's you know inadvertent or not. So you will receive um, an example of our uh, department-wide equity policy, and I'll just touch on that a little bit. I think the the piece that's so great about this is you know for a long time I was you know just due to my commitment to equity and my commitment to um, uh, working in a particular way with the populations we serve. And I'm sure all of you, right, have been embedding, you know, efforts to improve um, racial equity within the work that you do. Having a department-wide equity policy really creates a foundation and a structure in which um, it, it becomes less about one person really championing the work, but um, you know, uh, administration-wide and agency-wide effort that just gets reinforced and supported. So in that um, equity policy, you'll see that it aims to incorporate equity department-wide, ensuring that all employees better understand and incorporate equity across all aspects of business. It commits to providing resources to help embed equity in policies and programs and in, pre and in procedures. And so the goal is to really institutionalize an approach to decision making, to program and policy development, to implementation, to evaluation, to really improve the outcomes and reduce health and human service disparities and inequities of the people we serve. So incredible actions begin to happen as a result of an agency wide policy. So as a result of this policy, each administration has developed an equity charter, and that really governs the work um, you know, just getting more nuanced as it as it um, layers down. So, for example, within my Children and Family Services Administration, um, each division has an equity committee. The equity committees come together. I hope I have hired a diversity, equity, and inclusion director, and he and I chair um, uh, an equi a department wide uh, equity committee. And from there, we determine what are the what are the trainings that we think we should have um, at an administration level, what are the supports that need to be addressed to help break some of the, um, the, the structural racism that we might see, what are things that we can do to help support employees continue to move forward on their, on their journey. We address all the different things at that level. 
and then each equity committee within each administration further develops specifics regarding maybe their particular programs, things that they might see that's different than you know the larger the larger department efforts. So that could mean um, that um, there have been equity newsletters that have been developed to really help support managers and supervisors um, in addressing issues that they're seeing, helping normalize conversation around equity, the difference between equity and equality, as you saw in the video, um, talking about um, bias, speaking about and training about um, uh, uh, different experiences that folks might have within the department. We've implemented um, ERGs, employee resource groups, so that folks can have a time to come together with folks that look like them, that support them, so that they themselves can be um, bring their true selves to work and be supported. So you can see that there's sort of this layering approach that happens um, that really ends up being pretty, pretty strong. The other piece that we've implemented is um, every single one of our legislative proposals has an equity analysis. Each policy decision we bring to our Commissioner of Human Services has an equity analysis. So that answers with this decision, with this legislation, who's impacted? What are the data points? Have represented of the impacted groups been consulted about this policy, about this legislation? How will disparities be reduced? Is there sustainability? Additionally, each employee is expected to attend a certain number of equity trainings a year, and then it's part of their performance review process. Performance reviews for supervisors, managers, directors, and above all have at least one equity goal that's required and part of their performance review process. And then we have a, a, a wide variety of trainings, um, becoming anti-racist, increase in cultural awareness. My entire administration has um, taken the IDI, which is the Intercultural Development Inventory. And so this assesses where individuals and where units sit with regards to intercultural awareness and then provides an individual plan to help people move along the continuum. So you can see it's sort of a comprehensive approach and, um, and, and with a lot of support, right? So, uh, the goal is to provide all of this information, this education, this awareness, so that our policies and procedures can actually be impacted, our outcomes can actually change. So as a result of this, we've normalized the conversation around equity. People have language, they have common terms to help communicate. This creates empowerment. When they speak to communities of color, there are less mistakes made. There's more understanding and awareness that occurs. We've increased the expectations for action and then our policy and procedures are slowly changing. One of the ways in which our procedures are changing is around engagement. So in that equity analysis, we ask, were impacted groups consulted and who was consulted? And so in, our, um, in the actual equity policy, there's a, a portion that commits to providing resources. So we have within our, our um, state structure, we have an Office of Indian Policy that helps with some of the consultation. We have tribal liaisons, for example, tribal advisors. We have a department-wide Office of Engagement because what we found is that so many people had made mistakes in the past or seen engagement go terribly wrong that they became really afraid to actually move towards um, some community engagement because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. or We'd done it so many times with some of the same people and they never saw whatever change. And so we really saw, we were beginning to see a lack of engagement and an interest in, in engagement. So we've used a model that we've learned from our work with the BUILD initiative, which is really um, a model that involves intentional listening, note-taking with quotes from participants. This was referenced in um, the video before supporting those that we engage with, with childcare, with the supports that they need, transportation, payment. And then we bring the information back because we know that the families that we serve are not just in one program and the issues that they bring forward are often um, issues across multi-programs. So we share that, we commit to share that with our partners, whether that's in homelessness or SNAP or 
uh, TANF or MFIB, childcare, et cetera. And then the changes and decisions that we make as a result of that information, we circle back to those that we've engaged with and we let them know what has changed as a result of them engaging with us. And that has made an amazing difference. We've changed um, some of our contract language as a result to become more equitable. We have um, more community organizations of color applying for our contracts as a result of some of the changes that we've made. Um, we have stronger relationships with community and the trust is growing and building. So in addition to our agency, you know, our agency focus, um, our administration focus, our individual division and program focus, we also have the governor's office that has addressed racial equity. And so one of the examples of that is they have um, enacted a tribal consultation executive order. And so um, what, that, what that does is it guides the expectations around state government and tribal nation interactions. It requires a consultation process. And so um, it requires that we are proactive within state government to reach out to our tribal nation partners and identify uh, uh, policies and, and processes and engage in a government to government formal consultation process. Meaning that if I um, am interested in uh, changing something, a policy, I must reach out to a um, uh, a, a similar representative um, at the tribal nation. So as an executive leader, I reach out to an executive leader at the tribal nation. We don't have our program policy staff uh, reach out to a president of a tribal nation because that's considered disrespectful, right? So we have uh, uh, outlines of uh, procedures in which the government, the tribal governments and nations would like to intersect with us. And then <clears throat> we provide um, a consultation process with them as well. This takes time, it takes energy and um, patience. And as we've embarked in this, we too have seen great rewards um, with this process as well. Um, building trust, building um, uh, uh, new intersections, new coordination um, and improved outcomes with our, with our families. I think I'm almost out of time. Am I okay on time? I'm gonna keep going until you cut me off. Okay, uh, I'll go for a few more minutes. So I am, uh, uh, one other piece I just wanted to touch on is, you know, in the previous video, we had heard a little bit about um, the, you know, the importance of evaluation and data. And because we have our expectations built in our legislative, um, uh, equity analysis and our policy equity analysis, we have to do better in terms of how we are thinking about data. And so our, for example, our economic assistance evaluation team, data and evaluation team has developed four guiding principles that help them um, do better analysis with, um, with our programs and policies. So they ask questions. So they're looking to improve how we ask questions about individuals, race and ethnicity improve how our system, we have an old legacy system, but how it records data about race, ethnicity, immigration status, so that uh, what we can pull from is actually supporting what we are, what our outcomes, right, what we're trying to do. Um, we are working better with other agencies um, to define how we use the available data strategies for reporting on race and ethnicity. And then um, this will lead to um, uh, better understanding about how the potential program policy or rule changes will affect different race and ethnicity groups prior to the change and then use that information to change policy. So just a few more um, just examples of some of um, the outcomes that we've we've had as a result of this very intentional effort um, to work on staff policies procedures within the department. We have had a um, uh, 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 Minnesota Benefits, which is a uh, uh, access uh, to online application. We um, previously had an online application that um, took maybe 50 minutes to apply and our online application includes TANF, um, SNAF, SNAP, um, other cash assistance programs, childcare programs, a total of nine different programs. It took about 50 minutes for families to complete. Um, with a partnership with Code for America, we were able to um, make this available in Spanish, cut it down to 12 minutes for people to complete, 
and all of our tribal nations are 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 now um, uh, included. Previously, they were not included, right? So we've been able to focus in on technology solutions um, with an eye on equity. We also have um, been able to focus in on um, creating units within our department to help address some of the disparities. So one example of that is we have an African American unit in our child welfare unit where deep disparities exist. We've hired a team and are putting in place a process to add in a policy council that will um, from the community that will help us address some of the policies that exist within child welfare that can be impacted. And then finally, we're also um, doing a lot of work around whole family system work, which is just our ongoing effort to addressing system change within community um, and state partners with the goal of really um, identifying resources that um, uh, can really focus in on where they are most needed and can have an impact on, on racial equity. I feel like I zoomed right through there. I'm happy to answer questions um, and dig into any of these pieces that um, might be helpful for folks. Thank you, Tiki. The information was so helpful. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, we do have one question in the chat from Sharon. There is legislative analysis online for each bill or is that an internal only item? That is internal only. So um, we, in order to um, even propose an idea, you must have an equity analysis. We don't even, I don't even accept it. I don't look at it until it has an equity analysis. So in order to become part of the process for consideration for legislation, it must have that, um, that component completed. And then we have a divided legislature, I will just say. And so um, our, none of our bills passed last year, for example, um, out of health and human services. Um, but we've had to be uh, somewhat careful, I will say, right, in terms of language that we are utilizing with our, um, with our legislators. And so um, that although we include it, you know, we include our equity analysis, we include our data components, um, we, we are, we do recognize we, we are, um, we have a divided legislature, and we need to be careful about that. Can I ask one follow up on that too? Please. Um, is the equity analysis that you do, is that something that would potentially be shareable? Like if other states were interested in that? I know that you know, obviously it's an internal only, but it, if someone wanted to follow up, if they were interested in adding that? Absolutely, absolutely. We can share the documents that we, you know, have the questions embedded. And then we do have, if folks are interested, um, a sort of step by step process that we utilize early in, early in when we were you know, um, implementing this to help folks understand and think about um, how to answer the question and that could be useful as well. Terrific, thank you so much. Anyone else have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself or um, enter into the chat. Uh, hi, Tiki. Uh, great presentation. Um, have you been able to see the impact of what you've done on programs such as TANF? Are more people applying? Um, are the service and delivery better, et cetera? We are. Um, so, you know, there are, we have a number of, um, of, of pieces that we're working on. We have seen more people applying through, for example, our MN benefit, improved access, improved um, uh, language accessibility, uh, better connection to our tribal partners. We've seen improved um, applications from um, American Indian individuals, for example. Um, and so that, so that has been an improvement. Some of our other work, um, I, I mentioned there's, you know, the layering approach of it. So one of the layers that we have is our governor's office is supporting our MFIB and TANF efforts to create stability for families. That's a goal of the governor's office. And then that has allowed us to um, uh, put forth different legislation that helps provide supports to families. Um, so some of the legislation that we are, are looking at, and this, this will not have outcomes yet, but it will get there, right, is um, looking at our state's um, pretty onerous um, uh, drug testing, 
and we're looking to remove remove the drug testing for um, uh, economic assistance programs uh, because of the high disproportionality and the and upon analysis, um, you know, it's like 0.5% uh, turnaround uh, of, of drug testing. So there have been, um, because of this focus and these efforts, we've been able to put in place or at least attempt to put in place legislation that will help that we don't yet quite have outcomes on. The other piece I will add in as well is um, as a result of this focused effort, we've had greater coordination among some of our state agencies around data and deeper, deeper analysis. So with our Department of Economic and Employment Development, with this goal of increasing stability for our MFIB and TANA families. Um, we're in the process of uh, a year and a half long um, data uh, coordination process in which we're really delving deeply into what's, what, what, does, what does stabilization mean? What, uh, what is it that we'd like to achieve? What's the differences between MFIB families and um, uh, UI families, for example? Um, so it's helping support some of our efforts that we eventually will have greater Greater, greater data points on. Thank you. I see the questions coming in here. Yeah, um, here's one from Kathy Bullrig. Um, does the 12 to 15 minute application include Medicaid or only SNAP and cash benefits? It, uh, Medicaid was actually separated, unfortunately. So it includes nine programs um, and not Medicaid at this point. We hope to include them um, in about a year or so. Uh, another one here from Paul Palm. I'm sorry if I messed up your name. Uh, can you speak more to how impacted stakeholders and communities are consulted during policy development? Yes, yes. I can give an example of, um, let me see, I think about an example about policy development. Um, so one example might be um, when we are looking at for example, some of our legislative proposals um, to change, for example, the 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 drug the drug uh, testing. We, um, in order again, we have that equity analysis, but we also have that question about what what groups have been what groups have been consulted, and so each each program area determines you know what are the the impacted groups, who should they be reaching out to, but they also have to list who those groups are. So we're able to look and there's a scan uh, component to say, are you, have you reached out to our, um, uh, or of the groups that you've reached out to, who do they represent? Um, is it only white organizations, right? Um, is it only uh, American Indian organizations, right? We need to look to make sure that that is pretty inclusive. So that is kind of, that is built into the into that analysis. Um, and then the consultation can vary. Sometimes we use our, we have cult cultural and ethnic councils in our state. Um, we have one on Asian Pacific Islanders, American Indians, um, uh, Minnesotans with African descent and a Latino council. And um, we can reach out to them and they can help provide some coordinated um, community engagement or programs have that ability to work with um, existing partners to pull together focus groups. It really can vary. We, we um, no engagement is too small or too large. We've also done, you know, a series of focus groups across the state. So it varies. That's awesome. Um, I noticed that uh, Natasha, you, you had a hand up. Mm. Thanks, Chantel, I did. And then I just put my question in the chat. So uh, good morning, Tiki. I was curious about the um, equity committees that were formed. Just uh, curious about the level of staffing that you use. Do staff volunteer? Do you select staff? Like, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so staff do volunteer. We, um, so we'll send out a request. Um, when we first when we first implemented, we sent out a request from our AC inbox, the assistant commissioner inbox, notifying folks of this opportunity and inviting people to participate. Each uh, equity committee um, within each division has a chair or co-chair, and we let people decide what works for their individual um, divisions. So some have division directors that are co-chairing and like, you know, high level management that's co-chairing. Others had volunteers within their division to co-chair um, that committee. Um, 
we have found that leadership actually makes a difference there. That will, you know, that was one of our early, early findings that um, uh, leadership definitely needs to be involved. And the co-chair piece seems to be an important aspect of that, but staff at all levels are encouraged to participate. If there's, there's been some areas where they've had turnover or low participation and um, that leadership co-chairing has definitely helped to um, where we've actually done specific reach outs to say, hey, we think you'd be great on this committee. Would you please join? Um, here we have a question from David Kasabian. Um, is there any data you would like to look at but haven't been able to compile access or process? Yeah, a very good question. We have struggled and we have a very, we have a state that has been very, um, what do you call it, uh, strict with uh, some data sharing. And so um, we have a, uh, with this governor governor's administration, um, we have a children's cabinet that has actually helped work out data agreements with each state agency um, and the attorney general's office to ensure that we um, are able to share data between state agencies. Prior to that, we had a lot of difficulty in having access to our um, employment data, for example. Even internally, we had great difficulty in accessing, <clears throat> excuse me, Medicaid data. Um, we've, been, we've been able to have some really good partnership as of late with um, um, SNAP and Medicaid data uh, coordination, which hasn't happened in probably, you know, the 20 years that I've been working in state government until, until last year. So I think we're chipping away at it. Um, these data agreements have definitely helped, but um, the, the, our state's tendency to kind of control and, and lock down data has, has definitely been a problem in the past that I think we're, we're just reaching over the hump of that. Another question we have here um, from Stephanie Bossart. Um, do you have any specific guidelines that mm. you provide to physicians for their equity work groups? Yes, thank you for that question. And I didn't, I forgot to mention this. So in addition to the equity policy that you'll, you'll receive an example of that, you'll also receive um, the equity charter and that helps guide the work of the division equity work groups. Um, and they can change it, they can modify it, they can make it, um, you know, more, you know, uh, more specific to their particular division, but that really helps guide um, some of the standard policies and practices across each of the uh, work groups. And uh, Sharon has a follow up question to Another mm. question is, what steps do you take to reach out to communities? Does outreach happen at different times for the community? Thinking about parents juggling childcare and such might not be available during the day. Yeah, I will say this. Um, I mean, there's been pros and cons with the, the uh, pandemic and working remotely. Um, I, I don't know that we have the answer for some of the, the remote work. We are... Uh, as a agency is still about 98% remote in our work. And so I will say that, you know, since the pandemic, this has, has changed slightly. In some ways it's made it more accessible. We've had actually um, a lot of conversations from our rural communities and rural organizations and participants that have been able to access, um, you know, a Zoom meeting much more easily. And then we don't, we don't necessarily, um, uh, have some of the, the difficulties of transportation and childcare, um, but we have tried to do different timeframes. So some of the focus groups we've done have been at, you know, around seven o'clock at night. Um, some of the community conversations we've had um, have been outside of the normal business hours and even on weekends to try to reach a bigger and broader array of folks. I don't know that we have a formula, but um, we have definitely tried and consulted with some of our um, you know, whether it's the councils or some of our advisors within the department on when they think that particular community might be, be best suited. And we're, I would say we're slowly gathering a database of, um, you know, different things to try. I, I think the one thing is for certain, we can't just have a one and done um, at a particular time. We know that doesn't work.
Awesome. Any, um, any other questions, feel free to uh, unmute yourself, throw your comments or questions in the chat. I'll just add as people are thinking if there's any other questions, you know, I think this issue around engagement is, um, can be really difficult. I mentioned that we had some folks that were terrified to, um, to do actual engagement and we had other folks that were really worried about saying the wrong thing. Um, you know, in our legislative process, there's that period of time in which, um, you know, everything is embargoed. And so we've done a lot of training as well around when we are developing, what's the time frame for developing a legislative proposal? It should be about 18 months. And so you, we've encouraged people to do some sort of pre-conversations with folks and then develop and then, you know, put, in, put on paper the, the legislative proposal, we go back out in sort of a, a focused way um, through program area or divisions or through some of our key strategic partners and test out our, our policy proposal. And then we're in that period of embargoed information. And then once our proposal would be picked up by the governor's office, then we, uh, then we do some um, specific engagement to groups that we had spoken to previously to say, hey, it's in the governor's budget. We're so excited. Thank you for your help. Please support this process you know, throughout the legislative session. Uh, we have another here from Stephanie Bozart. Uh, did you develop staff training in-house or contract with an outside organization? We have done both. So we have a, in the last two, three years, we have an office of equity and inclusion that our commissioner has staffed and they're in the process of hiring trainers. So those trainers will um, have consistent training across the department, specifically around anti-racism. We also have equity directors that we've hired that have training backgrounds. And so they have provided training um, department-wide that anybody can access um, you know, across their particular areas of, of expertise. And then we've brought in, um, oh, we've also highlighted, you know, we have a pretty diverse staff. So we've highlighted, for example, um, different staff stories. So we've had, um, um, we have a large Hmong population and we have had staff bring in um, uh, gr the grandparents, for example, or parents that, participated in um, the secret war. They spoke about their escape from Laos and what it meant to come to, to the United States and, the, and their sort of immigrant experience. So we've been fortunate to also raise up stories among um, particular staff. And then we also have specifically brought in trainers around um, pieces that we felt like were very important, but maybe didn't have the expertise. Uh, microaggressions, um, um, history on, 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 you know, different populations, you name it. And Thea Seymour adds, uh, she says, this is a great presentation. And you shared that staff participates in the equity committees. As you look at your workforce, et cetera, how do you determine which policies and practices to focus on? Yeah, that's a great question because really there's never, <laughs> it never ends, right? There are so many. Um, so we will look to see, um, so with our workforce, I will say, um, but you can kind of, let me, let me back up here. There's a, there's a lot to that question. <laughs> so we, um, we have, we, we do hear from, we have a number of uh, employee engagement surveys. So that helps us. And that helps us guide, you know, what are the, what are areas that staff uh, particularly feel like should be focused in on. We know from some of our data, there are particular hotspots that we definitely need to focus in on. Um, and then we have, um, you know, personal preference. So like myself, right? I might have a particular focus area that I want uh, folks to, to dive into. So it's a combination. Um, of, of a variety of things. I think we have picked away at a number of different things. So early on, um, we really, we knew that we needed leadership of color. Um, we wanted our population, um, 
our, our employees to at least represent a percentage um, of uh, our participants in the state. So if we were serving 10% um, of uh, Latino populations, we want at least 10% um, Latino employees, right? And that should be represented in every aspect of our leadership structure as well. So there's been efforts like that to sort of help build up, um, but, but there's a variety. I don't know if that answered that question. That was hard for me, sorry. <laughs> I can explain a little bit more. Um, thank you for answering that. I, um, because in DC, we are doing a similar thing um, at the Department of Human Services. And when we meet with staff, there are a lot, you know, it's just a lot of information that's coming at us. But as you know, we don't have infinite resources as in time and people to sort of not only fix things, but heal any harm that had been done in the past. Yeah. And so I wanted to know, we also do an employment um, engagement survey annually. Um, and I was hoping you had like a magic bullet <laughs> um, that would sort of clarify um, if there's anything else that we can do, but it sounds like we're on the same path as you are. So we should do some lessons learned and keep in touch. Yes, I'd love that. I'd love that. I mean, I think some direction has been given through our equity policy, right? Where you know, we have implemented the equity analysis, right? But in terms of, um, you know, specific policies and practices to focus on, it has been a little bit more piecemeal. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to chat more about that and, and think that, think that through. I mean, I think the number one takeaway is it is sort of a continuous improvement process, right? There's so much to do. Um, there's no shortage of, of efforts to be made. Um, but some of the, the structural pieces that you can have in place helps relieve some of the, um, the stress, I would say, right, on managers, on employees, on directors of trying to do all the things and at least focus in on um, some aspects of it. And if there's enough support that allows them to be creative and innovative and think about um, some of the other work that maybe they haven't had the opportunity to think about. Yes, I totally agree. And I like that you're focusing both on the workforce and the community is you're not making a decision to do one or the other you're doing both yeah. so yeah great great presentation thank you Anthea has one more question in the chat um are those equity directors who are trainers are they also part of oh. the communities they are they are so um each, so um, let's think about how the structure is. So we have an office, office of equity and inclusion with a um, assistant commissioner who is a you know, chief equity officer. And that's uh, who I referenced that our commissioner has supported with staff that will have trainers um, that will address some kind of bigger, broader training efforts across the department as a whole. My administration has a, um, a, a diversity, equity and inclusion director that is helping support each of these equity committees that are co-chaired by you know, various people within each division. So my equity director does provide training and is part of each individual committee as well as my administration overall committee. Not an easy job. Thank you. Okay. Um... We may have time for uh, maybe one more question or comment if anyone has on the chat, raise hand. Hearing or seeing no more. Um, Tiki, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, been very informative and I, I hope hopeful to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope it was helpful. And yes, feel free to reach out via email. Happy to, um, you'll see some of the resources that, um, that I've shared and um, you maybe guess this is a passion. So happy to chat with anybody about, about this work.
birthday. I was just doing one last scan in the chat. Um, that was great. I could, I, could, I could listen to Tiki talk about her programs um, for much longer uh, than the time that we have. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, now we're doubling back um, to the slides before my technical problem, and ho hopefully I don't have any more. Um, but uh, with the president's call for uh, race equity within services, the Office of Family Assistance has a renewed interest and commitment to improving the equitable administration of OFA programs for all individuals and eligible TANF families. And um, I just wanted to take a minute to give you guys a, a brief overview of some of the work that um, we in OFA have been doing internally in order to address this issue. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we employed the um, services of uh, Dr. Nicole Bossard and her team um, to help guide us through um, designing a structure for the race equity work. And um, so far we've um, developed work groups. Um, all of the staff participating in these groups are volunteers and um, we have three. One is focusing on the culture, the work culture within OFA um, focusing on employee experience, employee comfort, um, and doing their work and in their work environment. The other is uh, human resources, where we're fo focusing on uh, HR practices, hiring practices, um, uh, staff evaluations, and things like that. And and the third group focuses on. Um, relationships and collaborations with partners outside of OFA, also uh, with an equity lens. Um, there's a lot to learn in that area and um, a lot of structures that need to be built. I'm sure we've got a long way to, way to go. We've only been at it for um, maybe a year or less than a year or so but I feel like we are making some headway and um, just look forward to continuing the work. Um, so as we started this session, um, it, it sort of, it's sort of a, a way to encourage you to focus on the data and use your data to help um, develop um, racial equity norms in your programs. So, um, with that, um, next slide, please. OFA is dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion and is investing in changing the narrative that informs policy and attitudes about American families in the lowest economic strata. Our priorities around racial equity are to strengthen TANF as a safety net program, apply a racial equity lens to our work, improve use of access to and quality of TANF data to inform program improvement. Next slide. Today, we're taking a soft approach to look at TANF policy and expenditure data with an equity lens by comparing that data to recent racial equity studies. Um, various studies issued over um, the, the past most most recent years and all of the sources are listed um, in the handouts you should uh, receive a copy of this presentation along with all of the sources that we've referenced um, so the pie chart it gives you an overall breakdown of how funds are spent in fiscal year 2020 despite the fact that TANF is subject to a litany of spending limitations and requirements TANF is a flexible funding stream which can be used for a, a wide variety of activities, as you can see. As you know, a family must have exhausted practically all of their resources in order to qualify for TANF. The program is intended to help meet a family's basic needs. However, on this chart, 
basic assistance represents cash payments and other benefits designed to meet the family's ongoing basic needs. And nationally, spending in this category makes up only 22% of TANF expenditures for that fiscal year. So this is not to say that other categories of expenditures are not important, but actual ongoing basic needs in comparison to the levels of basic assistance leave much to be desired. The basic needs of a TANF family are no different from our own family's basic needs. Yet, I doubt that many of us could imagine meeting those needs with only a TANF benefit. In addition to the details provided in the chart, there is another factor that's not reflected here, and that's the percentage of unspent or unobligated TANF funds that remain in federal accounts each year. Our time today is limited, so I won't stray onto this topic. I'll just say that it's an indicator that some states can do more. Many studies reveal that the implementation of TANF, implementation of TANF programs is based on racial stereotypes, inaccurate assumptions about safety net programs, and little understanding of the economic and social realities of the families that we serve. A study published in the Review of Black Political Economy indicates that the states with higher percentages of African Americans on the TANF caseload tend to spend less TANF funds on basic assistance. Uh, next slide, please. This map illustrates the percentages of funds spent on basic assistance across the states. Looking at both ends of the spectrums here, we see that 29 states, more than half of the states, spend less than 20% on basic assistance, and only seven states spend more than 30%. In recent racial equity studies, many of the states in the gray, or less than 10%, were noted to have the highest percentages of Blacks and Hispanics on their caseload. Next slide, please. This chart breaks down the TANF expenditure categories by state for the 22 states in our regions. Um, we were not able to include the territories because the 2020 expenditure data was not yet finalized. Um, but notice most basic assistance benefit levels a dark blue section for each bar in comparison to the remaining categories. And again, um, these slides will be available to you. It's a handout um, after, or it may already be on the site. Uh, next slide, please. Keeping all the prior data in mind, let's look at some demographics provided by um, census data. And this is for only for the 22 states represented in regions one through four um, in attendance today. Um, so for our states, Hispanic and Black children are overrepresented in poverty. These two groups make up 38% of all children. 58% of children in poverty, and 67% of children receiving TANF. Next slide, please. Now, let's consider the benefit levels. States have the flexibility to set their own policies determining benefit levels. This slide gives us a snapshot of all the state's maximum monthly benefits for a family of three. Our states in regions one through four are dark blue. The national medium is the magenta bar in the center and the dotted magenta line across the top represents the monthly threshold for poverty. The dotted teal line represents threshold for deep poverty, which is 50% of the federal poverty level. And all benefits, almost all benefits are below deep poverty. Studies reveal that African Americans are more likely to live in states with lower TANF benefit levels. It was reported that 53% of the nation's African American populations 
lives in states where benefits are at or below $356 per month. Only 39% of the white population lives in these states. I know it'd be, it would be more exciting to identify the states, but we decided not to call it anyone out. This presentation will in, uh, include, or at least the handout, will include individual profiles that has uh, state-specific data that you can always um, review uh, on your own time if you're interested. Next slide, please. Studies also reveal that states with higher proportion of African-American, Hispanic, TANF recipients generally have stricter policies. Several states have family cap policies that prevent or limit an increase in a family's benefit when another child is born. States highlighted in green were noted to have family cap policies in place in 2020. And most of those states happen to have higher proportions of minorities on the caseload. As I mentioned, the map is based on data as of 2020. So I'm pleased to provide you an update that uh, Connecticut has since eliminated their family cap on assistance. Uh, next slide. As you know, federal laws establish a 16 month time limit on receiving assistance. However, there are a number, of states, a number of states that have established time limits that are more stringent than required. The study noted in this slide indicates that states with more stringent time limits on assistance tend to have a higher percentage of Hispanics on their caseload. Uh, next slide, please. So in this slide, we share a different additional areas um, that can be considered for analysis. Um, other policies such as sanctions, upfront work, work requirements, and denials, um, employment outcomes, participation in work activities, and of course, impacts of, of COVID. Um, guys, we know we have a long way to go on this topic, but um, there's a lot to work with here. So um, in conclusion, we encourage states to strive for informed policy decisions and funding allocations that will remediate existing problems and foster equity in the TANF program. I'll admit the lessons of these charts are not crystal clear, but it may at least help start the discussion and make you ponder, is TANF really meeting the need as intended? And what would equity in TANF look like? Um, we've got to start somewhere. Additionally, I think it's well worth repeating that OFA is dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and is investing in changing the narrative that informs policy and attitudes about American families in the lowest economic strata. And um, that concludes my slides. Of course, we went in reverse order. Um, this uh, this last slide includes a list of all of the all of the um, sources referred to in um, these slides, and there are additional profiles, as I mentioned before, that includes data uh, for each state um, that are along these lines. So, if anyone has any questions or comments, um, you could just feel free to drop it in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, um, hearing none, it looks like, oh wait. Could a state interested in this topic ask for a TA? Um, this is a question from Sharon. 
And absolutely, um, our Welfare Care Technical Assistance Network is always available for TA and um, regardless of the topic and it definitely includes race equity. So you can feel free to reach out and I believe uh, we will have a link to the Payer Technical Assist Assistance Network uh, listed in uh, some of the sources that are handed out after the call or, or may have already be available on the call website. Um, what are the next steps or future plans? Um, Next steps, future plans. We are continuing to um, dive into the work group work in establishing racial equity in, in the three different facets of our program, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, that work is continuing. Um, it's a very great area. And as far as stepping it out, um, I think that we need to get to a point where we're satisfied with all of the internal work that we're doing um, before rolling out um, any of the external activities, I'm sure. But we're in a very, very early phase of this work. So it's really hard for me to define an actual step, but our plans are to integrate race equity in our programs. Uh, I have a question here from Sarah. If TANF benefits in most states up to 60 months, how do those states that have no time limit have this set up? Um, there are no states that have no time limit uh, I, what I said was that states have more stringent time limits, which is actually the opposite. Um, so uh, the federal limit is 60 months. There are some states who uh, limit assistance to 24 months or 21 months as opposed to 60. Um, and so uh, hopefully that responds to your question. Um, Sarah, you got a hand up. Good afternoon, Chantal. I just wanted to know, I, I did get what you were saying at first, but my whole thing is my understanding ten of benefits up to 60 months. And then in the, in the graph that you showed, there are two states that have a little bit more, you know, that they're extending more time versus the other states, how do they get away with doing that? That was really my question, the nook of my question. How do they get away with doing that? Oh, um, it's that the assistance would not be funded with federal dollars. Okay. If there are programs where um, there is no time limit or there's a time limit that's beyond uh, 60 months, it would be that that benefit is being funded with state dollars. Okay federal dollars. Thank you for that point of clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just scanning the chat here. And So um, if there are no additional comments or questions, um, we can go on to uh, next steps. So we had a video that um, we were planning to show during break, but it looks like we've got time so we can show the video and then uh, after the video, we'll have a brief 10 minute break. Um, 
it's a really interesting TED talk. I hope you guys find it interesting as well. Um, it's brief. And, and then right after the video, we'll go into a 10 minute break and I'll meet back here. Um, looks like 1150. Um, so uh, Mike, new video. <laughs> My dad's first lesson to me was, look people in the eye, mija. Make sure people see you and you see them. He has been a proud janitor, farm worker, shoe shiner, home builder, and small business owner. He has seen the world from so many different lenses and has lots of stories to tell. But there's one I've never been able to get out of my head. A story of when my dad was a young kid. He and my tío Mayo knew exactly when the trucks would come in. Under the freeway, just as the sun set, they jumped the fence to get into the dump. And as they waited for the trucks, they'd make bets on who would find the best food. An uneaten apple they could clean, a perfect banana, sometimes a candy bar or a wrap sandwich. And then they'd grab whatever they could find and save the very best to bring home to their even younger brothers and sisters. I hate that story, but I share it because we can't solve what we can't see. In 1936, this image of the migrant mother captured the living conditions in the West, showing lawmakers what people were going through. After it published, the United States government sent 20,000 pounds of food, and that image solidified support for the very first safety net programs in America. Yet still today, more than 37 million Americans are still living in poverty, one in six kids. As a student of economics and a career public servant, I know we've been at this for a long time. But it's my work today that has given me the hope that we can finally end poverty as we know it, and here's why. Right now, there are 80 public benefit programs all across the country intended to provide critical anti-poverty resources. Yet an estimated $60 billion in benefits go unclaimed every year. $60 billion, I believe in large part due to complicated, outdated systems that weren't designed to see the people they serve. I want you to imagine for a moment that you lost your job and you don't know how you're going to put food on the table, but you hear about this government program that can help. And so you begin the process of applying. The first thing you realize is you can't do it on the only online connection you have your phone, because the only way to apply online is through a desktop computer. So you head to the community library, you go through screen after screen, answering close to 200 questions, wading through confusing instructions. It feels a little bit like a game of gotcha, except your benefits are at risk. Now, if you're from a place like my hometown, a small rural farming town, there isn't an easily accessible public venue with desktop computers. So you have to find a ride to the nearest social services office, maybe 30 miles away. When you get there, you have to walk through metal detectors with two security guards past a long table of scattered paper forms into the main waiting room. It's loud, and there's a long line leading to that service counter. When you get to the front of it, you're met with a thick, clouded sheet of bulletproof glass separating you from someone who could finally help. That has been the system in America for many communities like mine. So it's no wonder that 14 million Americans aren't enrolled in child and food nutrition programs, or that 6 million are missing health care benefits. Technology has changed almost every aspect of our lives. It's made things faster, more efficient, automatic. We need to do the same for people seeking benefits. I work for an organization called Code for America. We deploy human-centered technology, the kind that respects you from the start, meets you where you are, provides an easy, positive experience. And our research has shown there are four factors we need to overcome. First, we know that far more people have access to the internet on their phone than a desktop computer, so applications should be online and mobile-friendly. Second, Lots of people are falling off because the process is complicated. So applications need to be simple and easy to use. 
Third, we know that people who are eligible for one program, like food assistance, are pretty likely to be eligible for another, like health care. So let's combine processes where we can. And finally, we know there are unseen heroes in government, caseworkers, social workers on the front lines navigating old systems. We can equip them with the data and tools to streamline their efforts. Here's what California's food assistance used to look like. 183 questions, 51 pages of screens, available only by desktop computer. We took that application and redesigned it. This is Get Cal Fresh, a mobile-first application available 24 hours a day in multiple languages with chat support. <laughs> California's food assistance application went from one of the most complex in the nation to being recognized as one of the easiest application experiences of any state. For 10 years, we had been working with multiple states on projects just like that, showing the importance and potential of digital delivery of benefits, and that's when the pandemic hit. And these images in West Valley, Utah, San Antonio, Texas, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, parking lots filled with families waiting for food. America could finally see what we had been seeing for a decade, the growing number of people in poverty and communities left out as a result of failing systems. Our phones started ringing. From Washington to Maryland, we helped states distribute $600 million in benefits to kids in school lunch programs. Louisiana shared, used our best practices tools in, notification, in notifying people. They proactively sent out more than 40 million texts to residents on how to access critical services. And in Minnesota, we developed an all-in-one application for nine different safety net benefits. That can be completed in less than 14 minutes. <laughs> Nearly 200,000 people immediately applied in the first six months, and for the first time ever, Minnesota's system integrated to reach all sovereign tribal nation members. That's what is possible, and this is the moment to keep going, redesigning our safety net for a new time and a new age, and we can do it all across the country as governments reset. Over the next seven years, we will partner to redesign systems to unlock $30 billion in benefits for 13 million eligible people in at least 15 states. We will bring data scientists and engineers, technologists and researchers together, sitting side by side with government teams. And our Safety Net Innovation Lab will improve upon and share best practices so that every government can benefit. Because at the heart of our audacious goal is to show the world what's possible when we use the best tools we have today, human-centered technology and government, so that families aren't waiting in parking lots for resources, or kids growing up like my dad, aren't searching for food by whatever means possible. Then, then we will see the true potential of every kid. And that's the calling of this moment, to redesign our systems, to see people, all people. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I think Amanda is so inspirational, and I hope you guys feel the same way too. Um, so right now we're going to go to a break and um, give you guys a chance to stretch, get some tea, some coffee, grab a snack, and um, be back at 11.50. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Eileen Friedman, and I have the uh, privilege of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Terry Horton. Um, this is the last session of our conference, our three-day conference, and I hope you've enjoyed all the topics that we've covered. Um, I've actually had the pleasure of talking with Dr. Horton in person before this call, and I've also watched her on TED Talks, and I think you're in for a real experience. Uh, Dr. Horton will deliver insights and results for clients that are needed to be successful in the accelerated 
uh, holding of the future of physical and virtual works of work. And I think it's never been a more important time than now as we're wandering through this pandemic and looking for an end, but we all know how our jobs have changed, our work has changed, our workspace has changed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Horton. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. It's morning for me, even afternoon for you. Next slide, please. I am a work futurist and my work, the, my expertise sits at the intersection of the future of work, automation and the impact, automation and AI and the impact to organizations and people. And today I am delighted to talk to you about the future of work, what it means to lead in the future of work and how you can prepare your clients to thrive. And all of that under the umbrella of what it means um, in this context to reorient, to reorient and to refocus and to rise. So let's get started. Next slide. I'm gonna start by providing some context around what the future of work is. It's not a new term or concept. I want you to think about it in this regard. When we refer to the future of work, it refers to the time period between 2020 and 2030. And we are well into, even though it is just 2022, we are well into the unfolding of the future of work. It is happening now, it is not in the future. And the future of work by its nature is transforming and all the elements that drive it are transforming how, when, where, and even in some respects, why we work. It is driven by digital transformation and digital transformation combines data, technology, and people in game-changing ways that allow organizations to solve new problems, be more efficient, effective, create better experiences for consumers, and employees. It is indeed absolutely game changing. Next slide, please. Before I walk you through how the future of work is shaping up, I want to look through the rear view mirror for a moment and talk about where we've been, particularly uh, starting in 2020. So in 2020, organizations were moving through the shock as we were as individuals, the shock of the pandemic. Um, with lockdowns, social distancing. There were other things that 2020 delivered as well, um, like a focus on civil justice and it amplified social and economic inequalities. And then organizations in 2021, as we moved through the shock, we moved, through, moved into a period that McKinsey refers to as the unfreezing period. And that means that organizations were really kind of assessing what happened and how they fared. Um, so it's kind of like being in a car accident and you realize the impact of the car accident and you're kind of looking around and assessing to see if everyone is okay. And that's what organizations did. And what they realized that they fared better than they thought. Most organizations were able to move through their resilient strategies and business continuity uh, strategies. And so the focus moving out of 2021 was to focus on the big reset. So shifting in the context of organizations, taking all of the information and all the data around what was learned about the business, people, clients, and partners, and then shifting strategies from surviving to thriving. Now, in the midst of all of that, as we roll through the end of 2021 through 2022, there were other things and challenges that emerged. We had the supply chain crisis, the great resignation where employees were reimagining what it meant to work in their relationship with employers and their perspectives around work and what it means in the context of their overall lives. We entered into geopolitical conflict. We are on the edge of a looming recession. The pandemic continues to move forward and we even have the introduction of a new virus, monkeypox. So if you think about where we've been and all of the intersections of challenges, all of these things coming together, have helped to accelerate the unfolding of the work by five to seven years. Some experts even argue that it accelerated the unfolding by 10 years. So think about how telehealth accelerated. Think about how remote work, how organizations may have been resistant to remote work in the past and how the pandemic accelerated that. Think about learn distance learning, both in K through 12 and higher education, and even the acceleration to the touchless society or touchless economy rather, amplified through this period or accelerated. Next slide, please. 
Now, as we think about the future, the future of where we're going is exciting. I want to peel it back for you. So now organizations, having come through all of this, are really focused on this thing called purpose. Who are we as an organization? And what type of impact do we want to have, both across employees, customers, partners, and communities? The other element that is accelerating some of the other movement is the acceleration of digital transformation. Digital transformation is how organizations use some technologies that existed before um, in conjunction with new and futuristic technologies, and they combine them in ways that we couldn't do, do before to solve new problems. But I want you to take this, keep this in mind. Digital transformation is the technology that facilitates the transformation of organizations, organizational culture, organizational business models, strategies, and this too can translate into the reimagination and transformation of jobs, processes, and even uh, products and services. And then we have remote and hybrid work. Remote and hybrid work is the future of work. And so with that comes the development of what's called a remote first culture. And that means that organizations have processes and infrastructure in place that facilitate the ease of working remotely, that fosters collaboration and there are tools and technology in place that enable that. And one of the aspects of change that's most exciting to me is a focus on employee experience. In fact, CEOs are prioritizing ex employee experience in the very same ways that they're uh, prioritizing customer experience. What does that look like? That means that focusing on experience means that leaders focus on how they can align organizational purpose with the purpose and interest of their employees. It means that they're focusing on diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. Other elements that are important to employees like fairness, career development, growth opportunities, and this delicate dance between work and life harmony. And there's also a focus on happiness. There's an interesting survey, um, actually an interesting article, you can Google it, Google it that um, talks about how Microsoft is shifting their approach relative to employee experience from evaluating engagement to evaluating happiness and the extent to which their employees are actually thriving. And why do organizations care about all of this stuff? Because there's this direct line through to engagement, productivity, performance, and retention. And then we talk about the future of work and all of this change. Of course, there has to be an element of development and upskilling and reskilling infused into this. So the future of work will demand that we are constantly learning. I always use the example, I stopped counting. I have probably 17, 16, 17 letters after my name add all the credentials together. That means nothing to me as a futurist. Why? Because I know that I have to continuously engage in learning. And when we talk about learning, we're talking about adding new skills. Upskilling means that we're adding new skills to your existing work. Reskilling means that your role has been completely reimagined or you're moving into a new role and you need an entirely new set of skills. And then there's outskilling. Out Outskilling is an approach that is ramping up in popularity among employers. And that is, as organizations move through transformation and they uh, right size and reorganize, understanding that there is a human element to that and employees will be impacted. So that is the investment in providing skilling and training for employees that will not be with the organization so that they have a soft landing. And that ties directly into creating or continuing to create a healthy employer brand. And then there is the metaverse. In fact, I just completed a class for LinkedIn Learning that will be available in October about um, what it means as HR professionals to lead and transition processes into the metaverse. And so the metaverse is this immersive environment in which at some point, it will fully be inter interoperable by 20, right around 2030 in the next 10, or 2032, 35. 
uh, 10 plus years or so. But there is activity happening now. Brands are moving into the metaverse um, to create in interesting and compelling in, uh, experiences for customers. But think about what employers are doing. Job fairs are moving into the metaverse, interviews, assessments, and even learning and, de and development. Because we have statistics that point to the fact that when learning happens in virtual reality environments or immersive environments, that the outcomes from training can increase by 75%. And then the metaverse is really emerging as an environment to bring remote workers together so that they can become create more creative, collaborative. Um, it cements organizational culture. And it creates a way to have stickiness, if you will, around um, a sense of community for employees and workers and enhance the experience. Next slide, please. Now, you heard the word digital transformation. I wanna walk you through this. Now, listen, this is an overwhelming slide, tons and tons of logos. Here's how I'm gonna break it down for you. Look over to your right, to your left rather, that all of those logos represent artificial intelligence and machine learning tools that help organizations come uh, uh, connect systems. So think about your own work environment and think about the fact that there may be four or five different systems that you use through the course of the day, but none of them talk to get talk to each other. So AI around infrastructure and in bringing infrastructure together across organizations to help leaders access information across the entire enterprise, and the entire customer or employee experience to be able to make better decisions in the middle. It is all about capturing the data. So it's about data analytics, predictive analytics, collecting data about employees in real time, and then using artificial intelligence and algorithms to predict outcomes, whether it's outcomes around um, um, customer expectations around products or services, or even predicting whether or not employees are engaged in the workforce or even at risk. Move over to the right. I want you to lean into the screen a bit for this. So if you look at the right in the area that's purple, that represents all of those logos represent how AI is replacing tasks associated with particular jobs. So look at the impact across sales, customer service, um, HR, we have artificial intelligence use uh, platforms like HireVue that use biometric and psychometric analysis to help um, in the interview process to better qualify candidates based on not just skills, qualifications, education um, and experience, but also cultural fit. Look further down, you can see the impact across industries, whether it's advertising, agriculture, education, or even, um, or, or even insurance. So when we talk about digital transformation, digital transformation in the future of work frightens people. And my job is to help really kind of demystify some of this. It is not about replacing jobs completely. It is about removing mundane and routine aspects of the work so that the employee can focus on higher value functions of the role and deliver a higher level of value to the organization. Okay, next slide, please. When we talk about transformation, now I told you, the pandemic and all the 2020 delivered accelerated the unfolding of the future of work by five to seven years. Gardner says that by 2028, that is not far away at all. Employees will use all sorts of interesting technologies. They will show up at work as avatars. They'll use all sorts of different types of language conversion software and dialect translation. Um, to be able to inter do com not only complete their work, but to interact with employees. I'm gonna show you a peek of this. We're gonna walk into the future. Next slide, please. This is what working in the metaverse will look like and much of this technology is available now and happening now. Let's see. Over the last year and a half, a lot of us who work in offices have gone remote. And while I miss seeing the people I work with, I think remote work is here to stay for a lot of people. So we're gonna need better tools to work together. Let's take a look at what working in the metaverse will be like. Imagine if you could be at the office without the commute. You would still have that sense of presence, shared physical space, 
those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere. Now imagine that you have your perfect work setup and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work setup. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. Looking good. Let's get together real quick for a debrief. I'm free now. Let's jump in. Hi. Hey. So what do we think? I think it's ready. Great. I'll prep it for the presentation. All right, good luck. Imagine a space where you can tune out distractions and focus on the task at hand. And when you're ready to share what you've been working on, you can present it as if you're right there with the team. Wait, where's Mark? I think he's in the middle of something. So it may feel like that those technologies are far off into the distance. I will tell you that they are not. In fact, if we look at it through the lens of education, there are eight universities from Morehouse to some of the universities in the Cal State, uh, Cal State University system that are launching uh, what's called metaversities this September where the professors will teach, will appear and students appear as avatars for their lectures and their learning. I'm actually speaking at an event as a hologram later this year. And I am doing training for a client in a few months as an avatar. The technology is there. In fact, Microsoft HoloLens, if you wanna think about how close we are to this um, democratizing this type of technology, the micro, uh, Microsoft has what's called the HoloLens 2. It is the um, technology that enables one to appear as a hologram. It's not that expensive from an enterprise perspective. One set, headset, is about $5,000. Now, will an organization use that technology for everyone? No, for select teams. But what you saw about bringing people together, employees together, whether they're working from home, appearing on a two, 2D flat screen like Zoom, integrated in with holograms, avatars, and real employees, that is happening now. And that will be normalized as we move more, if we, as we move more through uh, this decade and get to 2025. Now I've presented you with a lot of change about the future of work. So you can see, we can begin to rationalize that in order to lead effectively in this new and, and emerging environment demands a new type of leader. Yeah. And so if we think about all of the things that are driving this change, the rapid pace of change, the normalization of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and the challenges of organizations moving towards a focus of purpose and social impact, and as leaders figuring out how to operationalize that, figuring out how to lead, what does leadership really mean now in the context of this acceleration of remote and hybrid work? And then there is the focus of employee experience, all the rapid advancement of artificial intelligence, like I showed you on that slide, and then the impact of the great resignation. Let's take a look at some survey data from Gardner. The impact that the great resignation had on how employees think about work, their relationship with their employers, and how they want to prioritize work in relationship to their lives is evident here in the slide. So if you look at this 50, 60%, say that they shifted their attitude, though it's a little uh, tight, their, or towards the value of aspects of, of their outside work. 56% said that they uh, uh, want to have a better, a stronger impact on their ability to impact society. It's a little small on the slide on the screen here, but you can take a look at it and see, this is really compelling impact around how attitudes around work have changed and how employees want to be led. Next slide, please. So if the change, if, if, we, if the future of work demands a new type of leadership, then we have to think about what does this new leadership look like? What do future ready leaders do? 
Well, one of the first things that they do is they leverage emotional intelligence. And let's just pause there for a moment and look at the wheel. So a lot of times when we think about emotional intelligence, it's easy to rationalize that it really just means, you know, do I know myself and how do I work with others? It's a lot deeper than that when we start looking at it through the lens of what it means to lead in the future. It means that you were able to do what's called reality testing. You were able to see the world for what it is and what is happening and to be able to connect some dots on that. You're able to get out of your own way. And as a leader, being able to do that can help you make better decisions. It can help you to be more flexible. And it can help you to be more, not only more empathetic, but more optimistic. How can you lead through change? How can you lead through change and inspire others if you yourself are not optimistic about the future? It also means that you have to develop a growth mindset. And on the chart here, you'll see a comparison between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. With a fixed mindset, you are adverse to change. You're adverse to making mistakes. You're um, thrown off balance uh, by the success of others. And you don't look optimistically into the future in the context of what it means for you. And so to develop a growth mindset of, as a leader means that you're looking for new things to learn. You are embracing challenges, knowing that you will move forward through them and take your people with you. You will look to inspire others and you too are inspired by the, the success of others. And then there's this other paradigm when we talk about what, what is required of this new leader. It requires that you do what I say called is what I say is called thinking, acting, and performing like a futurist. That means that you are actively working to stay ahead of the future and the impact that it will have to your organization, your industry, your team, your partners, and your clients. And so here's a little model that I want you to take away from today, too. If you are focused on the future as a leader, you cannot have a myopic view around the business. That means that you're just looking at the business and the work that you do. You have to expand your thinking and your exposure around what's happening politically, economically, socially, technologically, from an environmental perspective, legally, from a regulatory perspective, how shifting consumer sentiment and behavior is changing. And then look for signals of change take that information, identify what is a trend or what's sticking, and you start making sense of that and then aligning these shifts with how it will impact the business. And then you begin to make connect the dots. So if you're a leader preparing for the future and you are focused on driving the business, creating the best outcomes for your clients, you're gonna to have to get out of your own way so that you can see what's actually happening. And if we tie that back to the EQ will, you cannot do reality testing if you are not looking at reality across these paradigms. And then you go through scenario planning, best case to worst case, what the team needs to do to perform in that regard across each of those. When you engage in this type of practice, it's a little work. But when you engage in this type of practice and thinking, acting, and performing like a futurist, it gives you more control over the outcomes. You can't control all of these other elements, but you can certainly control the impact for you. It gives you a sense of agency um, in the context of owning your future and that for your teams. And then you have to do all of this. If you think about this, you have a new identity. You move from being a leader that is leading and just managing rather just for productivity and performance, but you're managing for outcomes. If you're managing for outcomes, that enables you to embrace some of the shifts around the changing of work, particularly as remote work. You're not managing, micromanaging. You are managing for outcomes. You are very intentional. And then your role kind of evolves. Now, performance and productivity, of course, are still important. But they're not the primary focus. And you are evolving into a leader as coach or leader as inspirer as you move your teams through all of this. And this can uh, contributes to higher levels of performance in and of itself, the shift in approach contributes to higher levels of productivity and performance. Next slide, please. This is one of my quotes from my book. To be future ready leaders, you have to be multi-skilled, multifaceted, and understand how to apply the right intersections of skills 
because you are the architects and designers of the teams and organizations of the future. Next slide. We're gonna spend some time on this slide. So the last part of our discussion today is centered on the impact of the future of work on your clients and how you can prepare your clients to thrive. And we're gonna start out at the top. I introduced uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Many of you are familiar with this. And if you think about the work that you do, your work takes care of the bottom two levels of the pyramid, physiological needs, whether it's food, clothing, shelter, and then also safety needs. But if you were gonna really think about your role in driving positive outcomes for your clients, you're gonna to have to look at a focus on the whole client. Focusing on the whole client means that you see the potential of your client. And while your capability at the moment may just be to fill those lower level needs, you should be looking to do that in ways that over time enable the client to achieve their full potential. This means that you're not just solving for the short term. What other connections? What else can you do for the client to put them on the path to self-actualization or achieving their full potential? Are you facilitating a pathway for them to jobs of the future? Some of the jobs of the future that exist today are computer and mathematical occupations, consumer uh, computer information, business and marketing, healthcare and healthcare support, counselors and therapists. For the role that you're feeling, for what you're trying to solve for today, to move your client out of the bottom rounds, what are you doing today that positions them for a higher level of success and a higher level of connectivity to the future? What about skills? How is what you're doing to solve for them at the bottom of the pyramid, helping them to develop the skills of the future? This is a chart I've been using for some time. It's from uh, WEF, and it breaks down four core skills that everyone, regardless of role, needs because the future of work, the jobs that evolve through the future of work will require higher levels of problem solving, self-regulation and management, technological skills. And they break those four, in those four categories are housed 10 skills, analytical skills, critical thinking, com uh, complex problem solving, leadership skills, emotional intelligence, resilience. What are you doing to help them acquire and develop these skills along the way? Because these skills plug into the future. Look down at the bottom. When you take a look at the job landscape, look at some of the jobs, the jobs at the top the new jobs that are emerging are highly technical and highly critical, highly uh, centered on problem solving. What are some of the jobs at the bottom, the 85 million that are declining? Many of those de declining jobs fall in the categories that some of your clients may land in as you look to fill their needs at the bottom rungs of the pyramid. So if you're not focusing on the full, on the whole client and looking at them through the lens of how they will plug in to the evolving of the future of work, you can end up leaving them stuck at the bottom with no long-term path. What else do you need to do? You need to focus on helping them understand how artificial intelligence is impacting the job search, uh, the job search process. The journey, the job search journey is longer now and it is filled all in the center with a host of assessments, um, whether it's an interview assessment, recorded or video interview assessment that is using biometric and psychometric analysis, or it is an assessment of their skills that's using artificial intelligence embedded into neuroscience testing. All of this has changed. Sometimes your clients may end up having to do a simulation as a part of an assessment. I share this example often. I had a client that was applying for an entry-level position with a telecommunications com company, one, the global one that all of you will recognize. All of you, the first letter starts with an A. And it was a work from home customer service job. And it was completely, the, the um, uh, applicant uh, assessment process was completely automated. I could not pass it. 
and I have two master's degrees, a doctorate, a host of other credentials, and I study this stuff all of the time. What's shifting? What we know for a fact is that organizations are looking to, particularly as it relates to human resource, the human resource function, to make the HR professionals more effective in their roles as it relates to um, finding the right talent, right? And so they want them to spend less time on lower level positions. You have companies across the board, whether it's a customer service, work from home position, or a cook in a hotel, um, Hilton Hotels, AT&T, there are several organizations that have decided that they're not going to use HR talent to focus on low level, low skill positions that have high levels of turnover. They've literally outsourced, many have outsourced that process to AI and algorithms. So what does that mean to your clients? That means that it's tougher to penetrate those models. It's tougher to penetrate that process. So how are you preparing them for that? How are you preparing them for remote work and all of the skills that are required to work uh, in a remote environment and to be more collaborative and to be able to show up in environments like the metaverse? So when you think about the future of work, we know what leaders have to do. We know what your teams have to do. The future of work is amping up the ability or amping up the thickness, if you will, um, of the level of penetration that is needed to move your clients into work. So focusing on all of these things, in addition to all of the magnificent things that you do, enables you to do this through the lens of a futurist, through the lens of sense making, through the lens of dot connecting, and through the lens of enabling them to rise. Next slide. Why do you care about all of this? Why, why, why? Look at this statistic. By 2025, 75% of the workforce will be millennials. By 2030, 80% of the workforce will be millennials, Gen Z, and the alphas that are coming up underneath them. And so they have a very different perspective on work. Let's go take a look in the next slide. So in addition to looking at, looking to solve for the whole client and making considerations for everything that we discussed in the previous slide, you've got to get some psychographic information in, around them, about them as well, so that you understand what makes them tick and what their expert expectations are about work. They are very different in a lot of ways than that of Gen X and, and baby boomers. So invest in understanding them. There's some really interesting statistics for millennials. Look at this, 96%, 90% of them are looking for opportunities that enable them to grow. That goes back to the pyramid. Don't just plug me in. How is this gonna help me to grow? How will it help me to develop new skills? How will it help me to eventually move over um, in the next three to five years into what I uh, envision for myself for the future. What about Gen Z? Look at some of these. Office culture is critically important. So they wanna be plugged into organizations that are focused on what things like happiness and thriving. What else is important to them? 53% of them are okay with working jobs as freelancers. And 88% want to be able to work for an employer that is a culture that's grounded in work-life balance. What else can you do for them? As the future of work unfolds and or all of the other shifts that we talked about, one of the things we talked about was the fact that organizations were shifting, right, to a focus on purpose and social impact. And this, so this focus on uh, purpose and social impact means that when we think about it through the lens of people, they're focused on how can they leverage through the course of what they do in business and their partnerships and their impact, how does that contribute to dignity and equality? How does it contribute to prosperity relative to wealth generation and employment? And so that means that as organizations move through the, this transfer, this cultural transformation, that there will be opportunities for your clients that emerge in non-traditional places and in new spaces. So in seeing the client as a whole client with the potential and the ability to thrive in the, in the future, means that you're taking all of this into consideration and looking for new plugins for them as well. Next slide. I have four key takeaways for you. What I want you to know 
is that the future of work is dynamic. It is unfolding rapidly. It is different, but I promise you is, it is exciting. I want you to lean into the future of work, lean into the change. It will make you better. Why will it make you better? It'll make you a better leader. But all of this transition that you're doing as a leader to prepare for the to prepare, prepare for all of the change, not only enables you to lead your teams better, but there's some learning that evolves from that that is applicable to your own personal life and the lives of your family. You are the architects of the, of the future and your teams and your clients are relying on you. They can't see all that you see. They're looking to you to think, act, and perform like a futurist so that you can create pathways for them. You as leaders can do this, but you've got to show up with EQ. You've got to get out of your own way. And if there are any elements of a fixed mindset that you have, you have to begin transitioning out of a fixed mindset into a growth mindset so that you can drive impact. And then finally, you can't solve for your client if you don't see them completely and you don't see the potential that they have. And if you're not thinking and acting like a futurist, you will not even see the potential that's available or where you can plug them in, plug them in relative to the potential that they have. Next slide, please. During the pandemic, I wrote a book and the name of that book is Force Majeure. Force Majeure uh, is, definition of Force Majeure is an unexpected or uncontrollable event that happens. And I use the future of work as a metaphor for that and how that the future of work it, there's enough room in the future of work for everyone. However, there's a lot of work that you have to do to do that. And so it's a guide so that um, you are prepared to thrive on your terms in the future of work. Most workers are oblivious to much of this. And because of that, between now and 2030, will be an, 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 they will experience a series of disruptive and unanticipated and uncontrollable events that have significant that can have a ne significantly negative impact on their evolution through the future of work. I have gifted um, the organization uh, 25 books, and so some of you will receive those. If you um, do not receive one of the 25 that I've gifted, you can purchase the book on Amazon. It is a guide, self-reflective guide that gets you. Um, through the process of thinking about what the future means to you and how you plan that out. Next slide. All right, questions. We're open for questions. You can put them in the chat room. Um, I'd like to start out with something, Dr. Horton. Um, I think many of our states are moving toward in the direction you're talking about is seeing the client, meeting them where they're at and where they have to go. Um, but I, we spend so little money in training and education, we should be spending a lot more. But we also have a concern about ability. You know, there, these people come with a lot of, you know, stressful lives, et cetera, et cetera. So this work, the workforce that you're talking about is a workforce that doesn't exist for a lot of people. Uh, it, they're going to be looking in a different place for work. So what happens in the future to these people who can't get to that level? So the, uh, here's what I want you to know. The future of work and all of the dynamic change impacts roles from the C-suite all the way down to the mailroom. So even if you think about McDonald's, think about a fast food, McDonald's and some of the fast food uh, restaurants, uh, KFC piloted a new, um, I'm sorry, McDonald's piloted a new technology utilizing AI. It was so fantastic that IBM bought it. And so think about this. When you drive up to the teller, when you drive up to the window, hi, my name is Terry. Um, would you like to try our new, blank, whatever, our new cheeseburger? They are eliminating that role and utilizing artificial intelligence to use facial analysis, voice analysis, sentiment analysis to make customized recommendations to the person that comes through the drive through That eliminates one role, but you need someone to be also be able to analyze that data. Then you have someone at the, at the next level as you drive up that doesn't have to do that. You can hire for a lower skill and you need fewer of them. But there is a lot of AI that's also running as you need less um, uh, cashiers at the front and the experience in store becomes more automated. So now you take someone who was a manager at a McDonald's, let's say for years and years, and all of a sudden now there's all this dashboard AI driven data 
that they need to be able to read, analyze, and understand to make decisions around staffing, to make decisions around inventory, and to be able to make recommendations about how they should, how the, how the particular franchise should move forward as it relates to products and services. And so now that requires a different level of skill. If you think about um, supervised security guards working in retail, there are a lot of retail institutions that, have, that are utilizing now, particularly because of the environment that we're in today with increased crime and theft, that a lot of them are amping up the use of artificial intelligence and sensing and facial analysis and predictive analytics to decide who walks in the, based on who walks in the store, who might steal. So do we need as many security guards? No, we don't, but we do need to hire security guards that have some what? Some data fluency. So you, I could go over and break this out across a host of roles. At the end of the day, everyone needs those skills. Will you be filling fewer roles for security guards, fast food workers, retail workers? Absolutely. The ones that get in, first of all, have to have the level of data fluency to be able to pass the application process and then be able to meet the new requirements of those roles. Oh, I can't hear you. That's because my mute button's on. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we do have one uh, in our chat room from um, Damon Waters, who's with OFA, that millions of essential workers, quote unquote, will be automated out of work along with a considerable amount of professional workers. And it seems there is not enough um, to be, there's not going to be enough jobs. And how can we prepare those we serve, who our clients, our tenant clients, um, to compete for those jobs? Because Absolutely. like I mentioned earlier on, in some cases, it might be beyond them. Yep. So that means that you, if, if it's beyond them, let me say this, the future of work, there should be enough room in the future of work for everyone, but it will not be for everyone. Does that make sense? That's part of what kept me awake at night doing my research. So what role can you play with this? Think, act, and perform like a futurist. Have a keen understanding of what is evolving in the future. Can you, if you have a client that is 56, 57 years old and needs to be placed and you're trying to prepare them for jobs in the future, um, your approach to that is very different than it is for the 25-year-old um, that you can send through training to begin move, acquiring training for some of these other jobs that are evolving. That makes sense. It's a longer trajectory. And then if they have skill gaps, um, let's say you're moving them into jobs that are more technical. Um, if there are skill gaps involved, you have to find partners um, and, and educational partners to help try to fill some of those gaps. You have some back work to do. But at the end of the day, the goal should be to be preparing them for the jobs of the future. And those that can't, there's a lot of discussion around for those that can't, moving them towards entrepreneurship. And there are a lot of companies from JP Morgan Chase to Bank of America to Google that are investing in communities um, with projects to help develop opportunities for entrepreneurship for, uh, for uh, other uh, communities as well. So that falls under that umbrella of looking in new places as well. Uh, and we have another question in a chat room, similar to Damon's comment, interesting use of AI. Um, it says, I heard this morning that Amazon is testing a new system at Whole Foods, whereby shoppers can use their palm to pay for their groceries. Do not connect it with the re reduction in the workforce, but this is something we need to consider in our workforce, mm -hmm. uh, development programs and retooling our clients. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, when I think about Amazon, I mean, Amazon just announced last week they're eliminating 99,000 positions. That should be a red flag that that is a huge shift um, towards automation for the majority of the roles that are, above, are at the bottom. Does that make sense? And working in warehouse and logistics um, has been a great plug in. Um, for folks that are looking to move back in the world workplace or have been displaced. And so those jobs will go away. Does not mean, does not mean that they will not need, because I've gone to one of the, we have, there's a um, Amazon Fresh uh, here in California. There's a store in Culver City um, where you literally go in, you don't need a wallet. There's not really any, any humans there working and you pick up something, the basket is weighted, it scans it, it knows, God, it automatically scans it up to your wallet and you walk out the door. 
Um, so that is going to become more and more fluid as we talk about to the elimination of jobs in some of these categories, whether it was retail, fast food, or um, even logistics and warehouse as those diminish. Um, yes, there will be impacts, huge impacts um, for folks who have low level skills, low level skill jobs are the easiest to automate. So what are you doing to elevate your clients to the next level? This is kind of a, a game. What are you doing to elevate them to the next level of jobs where they can take advantage of that before it's time to move again, let's say in four, and five, four or five years. But low skill, low pay routine work uh, is not a safe place for your clients in the long term. I'm having trouble with my mouse here to get my chat to work. <laughs> not connecting so is can someone see the question in the chat for me please because sure. uh something's happened to my mouse yeah damon has a comment here there are three humanless amazon fresh locations in dc and the return centers are becoming humanless as well yep and then um sanjay daughter now noted noted uh tanif is relatively a short-term benefit that can provide a wide variety of services due to its flexibility what are the most essential short-term skills that a person can acquire to start to prepare them for the future? This is gonna be a simple answer, it's math skills. Why? Because math skills start, get, do assessments of where they are, and their math skills, start with basic math skills, move them into skills around statistics, because much of what they're going to be doing with data um, is statistical. I even teach grad students, I, I use this quick example, I teach for a um, top tier university and I teach an HR course, it's HR analytics and they've gotta be able to analyze data and predict turnover and things like that. Um, 30 students in the class, invariably, since I've been speaking, teaching this class, I'll have probably out of the 35 students who can't pass because they don't understand the basics of statistics to be able to set up a spreadsheet. And these are HR leaders with me. So start with basic math skills, move them into statistical skills. Once you do that, that allows you to move them into data analysis and, and um, data analytics. Then that'll help you move them into data science. Everyone, all of us as leaders, fast forward, are gonna need to have a background in data science. But that is the path you take them. Most of the, whether, again, whether you are a manager in a McDonald's or you are an HR leader and everything in between, as you saw on that chart of digital transformation with all of those logos plugging in, they are all generating what? Data. And then the job is, the purpose of that is to make the job of the human easier in some regards, but to also make it more complex to be able to make, to enable the human to make more complex decisions. So that I would say is the absolute touch point. If you don't start there, even some of these basic assessments, as I said, um, a lot of organizations are moving HR folks, uh, the recruiters away from recruiting for low skill, low pay, high turnover positions and having them focus on more critical roles and automating those. So starting with math, basic math will also help them get through some of these assessments. There's one you may want to, if this is helpful, Pymetrics, P-Y-M-E-T-R-I-C-S is an example of a neuroscience based test. And this is type of assessment is growing, growing in usage across organizations because it's like solving a word problem. White screen, orange, bu orange balloon. This is how much water it takes to fill up the balloon. This is how much money you get to fill up to buy the water. Don't waste any money, don't waste any water. And in trying to assess that it is using computer vision, that means not with your camera, to watch the candidate as the candidate answers the question. It is assessing for not only can the candidate solve it, or the applicant solve it rather, but it assesses 50 different areas from soft skills, hard skills to critical thinking skills, risk assessment, flexibility, critical thinking, complex problem solving, all of that. And so we are moving those types of assessments down lower. Does that make sense? So start with basic math. Everyone that, that, that is gonna be a core differentiator from being able to even get through an assessment to actually even being able to do a job that now requires um, um, the ability to look at that. I'll use one more example if you have a moment. I have a friend for years, 
Her dad was a prop, worked in property management for some of the largest property management companies in the country. He woke up one day, walked in. His boss told him, <clears throat> we've, start, we've bought a new system that's going to help us better manage our inventory and make repairs across all of our properties. At this point, he was in his, uh, I think, late 40s, early 50s. He had never used a computer before based on the type of work that he did. So they had to teach him how to use a computer. Teach him how to use a computer, all right? That took a bit. That was easy. That was the easy part. The next thing they had to teach him was, here's the software. Here's, this is what the software is supposed to do, and here's how it works. All right, took a little more time, but he got it. He lost his job. You want to know why he lost his job? Because the reason that the, or the company purchased the software was to help him to be able to make more critical decisions around staffing, the cost of inventory, and managing jobs. And if he used the software appropriately, he could reduce the number of staff needed across the properties, create uh, increase efficiency, and turn around time for repairs. But he couldn't read the data. So he could see the numbers. He knew how to log. He knew how to log onto a computer. He knew what the SIS software system was supposed to do. But what they need, the purpose of purchasing it is for was for him to be able to make broader level decisions. And he couldn't do it. That's why the math skills are important. I, I want to say if my husband are listening to this presentation, he agree with you a thousand percent. He's a math nut. I mean, he reads books like unsolvable math problems. <laughs> but uh, but it is important. Um, we have time maybe for one more question. Sure, sure. We do have one comment in the chat box. Another industrial revolution. And I guess that's what it is. And I I um, think of my there's no questions, just a statement, but I think of my grandchildren who are four and five and the world they're going to live in. Uh, it's going to be just amazing. This is going to be so used to them. I mean, it's going to be their way of life. And it's, um, it is amazing. The only thing I'm concerned about is the social part of it. How, how are we keep going as a, as a society, uh, being by ourselves and not interacting as much as we have in the past. And I guess those are things we'll see in the future. The next time we have you, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go, you go. We'll still, we'll still interact. You can take lessons from how we engaged uh, as soon as we had a little bit of freedom from the social distancing um, in 2020. We, we were still cautious and all of that, but we still had a human desire to connect and engage. And so we are long, far away. We are far away from, it, it, you know, it's predicted by 2026, we'll be spending, um, all. most people will spend one hour in the metaverse. And that'll be for either working, for, you know, socializing or, buying something or you know taking care of other aspects of their lives we are far off from spending extended periods of time in that space but we are still human and so the human spirit and desire to connect will still be there we'll do some of that connecting in an immersive environment but the human aspect will still be there well thank you thank you dr it was awesome i could listen to you all day long <laughs> my pleasure it's been my pleasure and I look forward to all that you will do for your clients as you prepare them for the future. I am excited for you um, and stay focused on, uh, on your theming. It's fantastic. Thank you again. Bye-bye. I'll transfer it over to, I guess, the closing. Thank you, Eileen. Well, um, I'd like to thank all of you, all of our participants from the states and region and states and territories in regions one, two, three, and four, all of our speakers, all of our special guests, um, OFA staff in the regions and central office, and our contractors from BLH and ICF, and all of our Zoom support staff. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with us for these three, three days. It's been chock full of rich information. Um, I've really enjoyed um, the topics that we've been able to discuss. Um, as we mentioned earlier uh, in the meeting, you will receive an email with more details about where you can find additional resources as well as the materials that were provided or that were um, mentioned and used in this meeting. So be on the lookout from that uh, for that. Um, I'd like for you all to just do something very quickly, if you wouldn't mind, if you could just enter into the chat just one word or one short phrase about how you feel um, after hearing all of the wonderful information that's been provided over the past three days. Um, is, has it been helpful? Are you looking forward to utilizing it? Um, do you feel encouraged? Just put in a word or a phrase in the chat. I see inspired. 
That's come across a couple of times, encouraged. What else are you thinking? What else are you feeling? Motivated. I love it. Keep it coming. Well, it, it, it was our hope that you would find some information that could be beneficial to you and uh, your program. But what, uh, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of information that's been provided. And what I would encourage you to do is just not to let the information stay here. Please don't log out from this meeting and have it be it. Please find at least one nugget, one tip, one bit of information that you're interested in following up on and talking with someone else about, whether it's someone in your jurisdiction or reaching back out to a speaker or communicating with someone in your region. Um, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to use it all. That's not the point. The point isn't to provide you with a lot of information and ask you to overhaul your entire program. Really what we'd like for you to do is get something from it and use it and just keep moving forward in a positive way. So thank you again for, for everything. So I'd like to echo LaMonica's comments. I think she's uh, really summed it up pretty well for me. Um, I also, I, there are a lot of nuggets here that I'm going to take back with me. Um, after uh, hearing Dr. Horton, I'll probably get myself a, a t-shirt that says from striving to thriving. Um, of course, I'll give you credit under Dr. Horton. But um, it, it's been a really, um, a really great content, I believe, um, during the past three days. And I hope you all feel the same way. And I uh, look forward to the next time. Hopefully, it's in person. Uh, thank you, Chantel. And I, I too, echo what my uh, two coworkers just said. And we do look forward to working with our states on everything we've heard over the last three days. Um, I know it's been very informative for me. I thought today was a, a, a great day. Um, and hopefully that in the future, we'll have more of these meetings. I think probably next year, we'll be looking towards a national meeting, but there'll be more to come on that. Uh, and after that, maybe we can see each other again. Maybe we'll be able to see each other again in a national meeting. So uh, there is hope for the future. Uh, as uh, Dr. Horton said, it's going to be a much different future. I hope we could pick our own avatars. <laughs> and we'll see what happens then. So um, everybody, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And thank you for coming and attending our meeting.